Hello, everyone, and thanks for attending today's webinar, Returning to Work During COVID-19, Employment and Privacy Law Considerations. Now, the webinar today is a joint effort of the Thompson Coburn Labor and Employment Group and our cybersecurity group. Before we begin, we'd like to cover a few brief housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webcast, you could submit them through the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer these uh, during the, the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed, or if we run out of time, we will answer them later via email. Uh, a copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource widget. You can find some additional answers to some common technical questions uh, located in the, the help widget at the bottom of the screen. Uh, this webinar is CLE accredited in California and Illinois for 1.0 hours of general CLE credit, in Missouri for 1.2 hours of general CLE credit, and in Texas for 1.0 general credit, which is pending. Uh, we award CLE based on the attendance for the entire 60 minutes. Uh, from time to time, you'll be required to click a pop-up on your screen to reflect your continued engagement. Your CLE certificate will be emailed to you later this afternoon once we've verified your attendance. Uh, the widget at the bottom of the screen saying certificate will only show you whether or not you've earned the certificate. Uh, we value your opinions and appreciate your participation in, in today's course. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to, to our webinar today. We have a great, it's a great and timely topic. Uh, everybody now with, with vaccinations, ramping up is thinking about uh, returning to work if they haven't already done so. Uh, and so there's a lot of planning goes into that and a lot of things that, that everybody wants to do to keep employees and others uh, safe when they do return. And so it raises a lot of uh, issues both on the employment side and on the privacy side. And so we have a, a great panel today to discuss some of those. Uh, I'm Jim Shreve. I'm uh, chair of the cybersecurity group at Thompson Coburn. I've been practicing privacy in, in cybersecurity law for uh, over 20 years, and I deal with a variety of issues, both on the privacy and uh, security side. And uh, with that, I'll pass it on to, uh, to Ryan. Thanks, Jim. Uh, good morning, or good morning to some, good afternoon to others. Uh, my name is Ryan Gabauer. I am an associate in the Labor Employment Group for Thompson Coburn, uh, working out of the Chicago office. And I'll pass it over to Jim. I mean, I'm sorry, to John. Good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm John Viola. I'm a partner in Thompson Coburn's Labor and Employment Group, and I practice out of our Los, An Los Angeles office. And I handle matters that are not only unique to California, which, as you know, there are many, but also uh, of national concern. And I'll pass good it on afternoon. to Libby. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Libby Casali. I'm an associate in business litigation in the St. Louis office. And with that, I'll pass it back to Jim. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, so what, what we're going to go through today. So we're, we're going to start off talking about um, some of the, the general workplace safety rules and guidelines, uh, some other re returning to work issues around vaccines and uh, dealing with employees who refuse vaccines or may refuse to return to work. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about an Illinois law that can come into play here uh, with, with certain uh, screening, uh, the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act. And then we're going to go into a few other privacy issues, both at the federal and state level. And then finally, we'll take some questions and answers at the, uh, at the end of the, the presentation. So um, thank you. And so with that, I'll pass it uh, back over to John Viola. Thanks, Jim, and good morning again, and good afternoon, everyone. You know, as you've probably heard, many states and counties are reducing, I'll say, their tier status. For instance, in California, we went from the purple down to the red tier, and it's rumored they we're going to go down to the orange tier in a week or so. So more and more businesses are reopening, dining establishments, gyms, offices, and the like. So... What can you do from an employer point of view to make sure you reopen legally and with appropriate safety guidelines? That's what I'd like to talk about for the next 15 minutes or so. And there's several issues I think you need to consider when you transition from a non-working or a remote working environment back to in-person working. 
first and perhaps most important of all, you need to make sure that your state or your local government actually allows employees to return to work in an in-person working environment in the first place. I know there's been a lot of news coverage about people going back to work, mass mandates and the like, but this is a constantly changing area, and you really need to make sure your state or local government allows you to open before you can reopen to in-person working. Now, assuming that you can reopen from a legal perspective, there are several safety measures that I think you should take before people return to work in person. And you're going to need to maintain these safety protocols throughout the duration of the pandemic and maybe even beyond if we can't eradicate this virus in a timely manner or at all. So let's talk first about what you can do to keep your employees safe. And as we'll discuss in a few minutes, something that goes part and parcel with that, what you can do to protect yourself from lawsuits. Make sure that you follow all federal, state, local, OSHA, and Centers for Disease Control guidelines regarding wearing face masks, washing hands, social distancing, sanitizing equipment, and the like. You should establish procedures, checklists, and protocols for those working at your facility, such as having written screenings, acknowledge temperature checks. You also should communicate to your employees what your policies and procedures are for keeping your workplace and your employees safe. If one of your employees comes down with the coronavirus, you should investigate and document what steps you've taken to keep your employees safe and any specifics regarding the particular employee. But as Jim and Libby are going to talk about later, please remember, you need to keep this information private and confidential. So with that general background, let's talk about some of the specific requirements you must follow, starting with OSHA. On the very day after the inauguration, President Biden ordered OSHA to consider whether emergency temporary standards are necessary to protect workers. And OSHA complied and issued new guidelines only less than two weeks later, on January 29, 2021. And then further on March 12th, OSHA announced a national emphasis program under which it targets industries such as in the meatpacking industry, which has received a lot of notoriety, or in the nursing home industry, where workers are at a high risk of contracting COVID-19. The program includes an added focus to make sure that employees are protected from retaliation if they complain about unsafe or unhealthy working conditions, such as failure to follow OSHA's guidelines. So OSHA has some mandatory safe, safety and health guidelines, which include, one, you need to require face coverings or surgical masks for all employees, and two, you need to implement a COVID-19 prevention program, which should include conducting a hazard assessment, identifying measures to limit the spread of COVID-19, for example, implementing physical distancing or installing barriers where physical distancing can't be maintained. OSHA requires the use of personal protective equipment, including improved ventilation, providing supplies for good hygiene, such as soap, or antibacterial agents, uh, and also that you provide for routine cleaning and disinfection of your facility. OSHA also requires you to adopt measures to make sure that workers who are infected or are potentially infected or exposed to the virus are separated from your workforce and sent home. And last but not least, OSHA requires you to implement protection from retaliation for workers who raise COVID-19 related safety concerns. Now I'm located in California and of course California like many other states has its own OSHA. In California it's called Cal OSHA. But even if you're not located in California and don't even have any employees in California, Cal OSHA has established COVID-19 emergency temporary standards which I think provide a good framework for returning to the office safely wherever you might be. These standards apply, of course, to all California employees with only very limited extent exceptions. The standards became effective on November 30th, 2020, 
and they require employees to develop a written COVID-19 prevention program or to ensure that elements of the program are included in an employer's already existing illness and prevention program. So what must employers do under California law, under Cal OSHA? And again, this really, I think, are, provides good guidelines for everyone to keep their workers safe and to protect you from lawsuits. So under Cal OSHA's temporary emergency standards, employers must, first of all, communicate with their employees about employers, about your COVID-19 prevention procedures. And this, of course, will also make your employees feel more secure in the workplace. You need to identify, evaluate, and correct COVID-19 hazards. You need to mandate physical distancing of at least six feet, unless it's not possible, and then you need to install physical barriers. You need to require the use of face coverings, even if not mandatory in your jurisdiction. You need to use engineering controls and personal protective equipment is required to reduce transmission risk, to implement procedures to investigate and respond to COVID-19 cases in your workplace, to provide training on safety has aspects of COVID-19 to your employees, and of course, to provide testing to employees who are exposed to a COVID-19 case. And if there's a multiple infection or a major outbreak, you need to implement regular workplace testing for employees who are in the exposed areas. Cal OSHA also requires you to exclude COVID-19 cases and exposed employees from the workplace until they are no longer an infection risk, establish return to work criteria, and last but not least, maintain records of COVID-19 cases. Again, please keep them private and report serious illnesses and cases to Cal OSHA or your local health department. Now, I know this is a lot to implement. But to make life at least a little bit easier with respect to developing the written plan, Cal OSHA has posted a model COVID-19 prevention program on its website for employers to use. And in my experience, my clients have used the model plan with very few modifications, if any. And again, even if you don't have California facilities, and even if you don't have a single California employee, Implementing these procedures might help protect your workforce and you from liability with respect to COVID-19 issues. And they'll also make sure that you're in compliance with federal OSHA guidelines and requirements. Let's not forget about the CDC, of course. The CDC has issued what it calls tips for protecting employees' health. These tips include actively encouraging sick employees to stay home, promoting etiquette for coughing, sneezing, and hand washing, minimizing face-to-face -face contact, performing routine environmental cleaning, the use of teleconferencing services and video conferencing, as we're doing now, instead of travel and in-person meetings, and last but not least, just like OSHA and Cal OSHA, separating employees who become sick at work from others and sending them home immediately. Let's turn to what's going on on the lawsuit front. Because as you've heard, there have been many cases already filed with respect to COVID-19. So if, there's, if you and your worker safety isn't enough, there's an added benefit to following the safety tips and requirements of the government agencies, and that's to keep you safe from liability. Many cases have already been filed by both employees and unions across the country, accusing employers of having unsafe workplaces, and even that employers can be liable for their employees becoming infected with the coronavirus. Cases have been filed against employers by families of workers who died from COVID-19, in which they allege that the employer failed to keep its employees safe while at work. Some of these cases involve claims that employers failed to provide masks, failed to train employees properly about contracting the virus, fail to provide PPE at all or fail to provide adequate PPE to the employees, fail to conduct contract tracing, fail to test employees for COVID-19, fail to quarantine employees exposed to the virus, fail to apply social distancing, fail to properly clean areas, fail to warn employees of the dangers of contracting the virus while at work, 
and failing to follow the business's own safety rules, practices, and procedures, let alone OSHA's or the CDC's. On top of this, many states' workers' compensation laws, including in California, have been amended to provide a rebuttable presumption that an employee's illness related to coronavirus is an occupational injury and therefore the employee may be eligible for workers' comp benefits. And there's also been a rising tide of lawsuits in which current and former employees claim that workplaces are not compliant with COVID-19 health and safety guidelines are public nuisances and that the courts or regulatory agencies should step in to abate the problem by fines or with injunctions or even closing the business down. So you really want to make sure you're complying with the health and safety guidelines of OSHA, your state and local government, and the CDC. Legal and safety issues aside, there's some other things you might also want to consider doing. I think you should give employees as much notice as possible about ending remote working arrangements so that your employees can make childcare arrangements and alter their schedules as necessary to allow for commuting and coming into the work in the office during your regular business hours, given that many employers have adopted flexible hours while employees are working remotely from home. And as I spoke about a few minutes ago, I think you should also educate your employees about the protective measures you've taken to guard against transmission of COVID-19. Not only do you want your employees to follow these safety measures starting the very first second they enter your office, but you want to reassure them that you've made the workplace as safe as possible to avoid having issues with employees who simply are afraid to return to work for fear that they might contract the virus or bring it home to a family member. If your employees have concerns about their safety or if they need accommodation for a disability, have them get in touch with your HR department. And with that, let me turn it over to Ryan. Ryan, what should employers do about having their employees vaccinated? Thanks, John. Um, that is an excellent question and certainly a question that I'm sure is top of mind for all of you and for many employers right now. Let me start by saying that um, as we've seen with so much during the pandemic, there's really no clear answer to this, unfortunately. Um, you should keep in mind that what may work for other organizations may not work for your organization and your employees. There's definitely no one size fits all here. So what should your organization do about COVID vaccines for employees? Can you require your employees to get vaccinated before returning to the workplace? or as a condition of employment? Even if you can legally, should you mandate the vaccine? Um, or would it be best for your organization to encourage or provide some sort of incentive for your employees to get vaccinated? And maybe it's best uh, for you to stay neutral on the issue and say nothing at all. These are all very complicated decisions. And quite frankly, we could spend the entire day discussing a number of not only legal but practical issues that are involved with this issue. Um, we don't have all day, unfortunately. We have roughly 15 minutes, so we'll do our best to flag as many of these issues as possible for you to consider. Um, but please keep in mind that a deeper analysis and possibly consideration of other issues uh, may be needed before you implement any COVID vaccination policy. One last disclaimer before we uh, jump in into the substance. Um, as has been the case with everything COVID related, the legal and business landscape is constantly evolving, almost on a daily basis. Um, this will absolutely be the case, I think, for workplace vaccination policies. So it is critical to make sure that um, any vaccination policy you do end up implementing complies with the most current guidelines and laws and requirements. So let's first address whether employers can legally require employees to get a COVID vaccine as a condition of returning to or remaining in the workplace. The short answer I can give to you for now as of March 24th um, in true lawyer fashion is likely yes, 
but with certain conditions. As a starting point, there is currently no law or regulation that directly addresses this issue. Um, but as many of you may have seen in December, the EEOC issued guidance that generally held um, that employers may mandate the vaccine so long as they comply with the ADA, Title VII, and, and similar state laws by reasonably accommodating um, their employees' objections to the vaccines that may be based on disabilities, religious beliefs, or other protected statuses. You'll see a link, uh, it's on the second to last slide, the resources page, there's a link that we've included to the EEOC's guidance. Um, but I'm gonna turn it back to John who will take you through a deeper dive uh, into what the EEOC's guidance actually says. Thanks, Ryan. So what does the EEOC say with respect to the ADA? Well, the EEOC's guidance on this issue was largely focused on disability-related inquiries and accommodations for employees' disabilities. The EEOC has confirmed that the COVID-19 vaccination in and of itself is not a medical examination under the ADA because the employer is not seeking information about the employee's impairments or current health status. Therefore, under current guidance, and of course that can change, and the guidance changes, it seems, almost hourly, an employer doesn't need to establish that a vaccine is job-related and consistent with business necessity for it to require its workforce to receive the vaccine. Along these lines, the EEOC also states that requiring an employee to provide proof that he or she has received a COVID-19 vaccination is not a disability-related inquiry. But the EEOC has also warned us that pre-vaccination medical screenings, which are required to determine whether an individual may be vaccinated, do in fact trigger the ADA's protections regarding disability-related inquiries because they're likely to elicit information about a disability. So if you plan to administer the vaccine yourself to employees or to contract with a third party to administer the vaccine on your behalf, you're gonna to need to demonstrate that any screening questions you ask are job-related and consistent with business necessity. In other words, you're gonna to have to show that an employee who does not answer the questions on the questionnaire and therefore doesn't receive a vaccine is going to pose a direct threat to the health or safety of those in the workplace. Because the EEOC already has recognized that an unvaccinated employee likely would pose a direct threat to others in the workplace, any screening involved in requiring and administering the vaccination would, for now, likely be considered job-related and consistent with business necessity and therefore permissible under existing ADA requirements. The EEOC also reminds employers that the implementation and enforcement of a mandatory COVID-19 vaccine policy must not discriminate against employees with disabilities under the ADA and similar state laws. So when you respond to disability-related objections to COVID-19 vaccinations, you need to handle these just as you would any other disability accommodation request and determine whether the unvaccinated employee poses a direct threat to the health or safety of those in your workplace. Generally speaking, for now, in the majority of cases, employers likely could conclude that an unvaccinated employee poses a direct threat to others in the workplace. Since the EEOC has stated that a direct threat includes, quote, a determination that an unvaccinated individual will expose others to the virus at the work site, unquote. But before you exclude an unvaccinated employee from your workplace, you need to consider whether there's an accommodation that would eliminate the direct threat or reduce it to accessible levels without creating undue hardship. You know, and I think what's gonna happen here is that a popular accommodation request is gonna be that an employee requests to continue to work remotely or will work remotely if they haven't done so before. So you need to keep in mind 
that if your employees have been working remotely relatively seamlessly during this last year or so during the pandemic, it's going to be difficult for you to argue that continuing in a combination of remote working is going to pose an undue hardship now that you have employees returning back to your office. There's a few other important considerations we should touch on. First, the ability for you to exclude an unvaccinated individual from your physical workplace is not the same thing as your ability to terminate that individual's employment. You need to consider whether the employee is entitled to legally mandated leave, such as under the FMLA, or your own leave policy. You also, I think, need to keep in mind that pregnant employees may also be entitled to job modifications under Title VII or state law or reasonable accommodation for pregnancy-related illnesses and medical conditions. Now, what do you do about employees who refuse to turn, return to work for fear of contracting COVID-19 or bringing it home to their family members? Well, a general fear of the vaccine not tied to a mental or physical disability is unlikely to qualify as a protected status under the ADA. As you do with any disability accommodation request, you may require an employee to provide documentation from a medical provider stating the employee's medical condition, how it affects major life activities, how it specifically prevents the employee from being vaccinated, and how long will the condition last? In other words, can the employer get the vaccine in the future? Now, you may have heard that many religious groups have objections to the vaccine. Per the EEO's guidance, any mandatory COVID-19 vaccination policy must allow for religious objections to the vaccine under Title VII and similar state laws. In a nutshell, Title VII requires employers to accommodate employees who refuse employer-mandated vaccines based on a sincerely held religious belief, practice, or observance unless a combination would pose an undue hardship. It's important to remember that accommodation analyses are really highly fact-specific and will be evolving as the vaccination becomes more widely distributed and available. For example, for now, the EEOC has determined that COVID-19 poses a direct threat but as the COVID landscape changes with better treatments, fewer cases, widespread vaccinations, and the so-called herd immunity, it might be difficult to show that an unvaccinated employee poses a direct threat, and greater accommodation of objections to vaccination might be required. So again, this is a constantly evolving and changing landscape. With that, let me turn it back over to Ryan to talk about other issues to consider before you implement a mandatory vaccination policy. Thanks, John. Um, so aside from complying with the ADA and religious objections under Title VII that John just went through and that the EEOC has touched on, there are a number of other laws and issues to consider before you decide what you should do, uh, if anything, about COVID vaccinations in the workplace. For example, uh, a few other federal laws should be considered, the Fair Labor Standards Act, or you know the FLSA, and state-specific wage and hour laws may require employers to compensate the time that their employees spend getting employer-mandated vaccines and possibly compensate um, their travel to and from uh, the vaccination site to the office. You should also keep in mind that the National Labor Relations Act, the NLRA, prevents employers from infringing upon employees, um, and that's all employees, not just union employees, uh, infringing upon their concerted activity, which may include an effort to oppose mandatory vaccines or even oppose the absence of a vaccine policy. You should also keep a close eye on any guidance or regs from OSHA. Um, as it stands right now, OSHA has yet to opine specifically on mandatory COVID vaccines in the workplace, but it previously supported employer-mandated flu vaccines. 
except um, for one condition, and that's where an employee has, quote, a reasonable belief that he or she has a medical condition that creates a danger of a serious reaction to the vaccine, end quote. So if OSHA takes a similar position with employer-mandated COVID vaccines, you should be prepared to um, possibly accommodate that objection uh, to the vaccine uh, to avoid any possible retaliation claim under OSHA. On the flip side, though, if employers do not mandate vaccines or they stay silent on the issue, employees may claim that the employer is not complying with its general duty under OSHA to ensure a hazardous free workplace. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Another uh, law to consider would be the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, otherwise known as GINA. Um, if your organization or a third party on your organization's behalf administers the vaccine to your employees uh, and therefore engages in the required pre-vaccine medical screenings or requires proof that your employees have received the vaccine, you should advise your employees not to provide any genetic information uh, to avoid any violation of GINA, which essentially prohibits discrimination in the workplace on the basis of genetic information. In addition to federal law, there are a host of state and local laws that you should be mindful of. Um, obviously, we can't touch on, on all, but a few uh, big items to consider. Some states impose a more broad duty to accommodate religious objections than Title VII provides. Um, some states define disability under their uh, you know, anti-discrimination laws far more broadly than the ADA does. Washington, D.C., and some states prohibit discrimination against employees on the basis of their political beliefs or uh, political party affiliations. So um, you can imagine possibly a situation where an employee opposes uh, an employer-mandated vaccine and that opposition is tied to or arguably could be tied to a political belief or a political party. Um, that employee's objection to the vaccine may be protected in, in some states. Similarly, some states such as New York and Colorado prohibit discrimination based on legal off-duty conduct. So if you take it, an adverse action against an employee who refuses uh, a mandated COVID vaccine and you're aware that that employee, for example, um, recently participated in a legal off-duty rally against vaccinations, uh, I, I can envision a situation where that employee may claim the adverse action was because of his or her uh, opposition against vaccinations. Something to definitely keep a close eye on is a number of states, uh, some in direct response to the EEOC's guidance that John just went through, have proposed legislation that either prohibits discrimination on the basis of an employee's opposition to vaccinations, or some um, to completely outlaw mandatory vaccine policies in the workplace. So you definitely want to uh, keep an eye on any uh, applicable laws that are proposed in, in jurisdictions where your workforce is located. Another um, thing to consider is New York and California have recently passed laws requiring employers to provide paid sick leave for employees getting vaccinated. And as I'm sure you've noticed before, the, the trend often goes with employment laws that what happens on the coast in California and New York often spreads to the rest of the country. So um, similar paid sick leave laws might pop up in other states. If you have a unionized workforce, um, you should definitely consult your collective bargaining agreement um, because that agreement may limit your ability to mandate COVID vaccines. And even if it doesn't, um, a mandatory vaccination policy is likely, uh, would likely be considered a mandatory subject of bargaining. So you should be cautious not to unilaterally implement any mandatory COVID uh, vaccine policy if you have a union. Another thing to think about, and this is true for any workplace policy, as I'm sure you all know, but any vaccination policy absolutely has to be consistently applied and enforced among, such, among situ similarly situated employees. 
uh, to avoid any discrimination claims. Another thing to consider is how you might handle situations where an employee suffers or claims to suffer uh, side effects or some harm from the, the COVID vaccine if it's been mandated by the employer. You know, we've seen some reports and studies that a small percentage of individuals may suffer side effects from the COVID vaccines, but I don't think we really know the extent of any possible side effects given the, the newness of, of the vaccines. Um, so she, you should at least be prepared with how you'll handle situations if your employee becomes ill or has side effects from the vaccine that you've mandated. One thing I've, I've seen some employers do is you may want to consider giving paid leave uh, during the period in which the employee is recovering from any side effects. But at the least, you should discuss any mandatory vaccination policy with your insurance carriers, um, especially your workers' compensation insurer, uh, to address any coverage uh, in the event that your employee does become ill from side effects. And keep in mind that if, if a vaccinated related illness is not covered by your state's workers' comp law, or if there's no exclusive remedy clause in the state's workers' comp law, there may be the potential for tort liability against the employer who mandated the vaccine. As John touched on a little bit, um, I just wanna reiterate that you should keep in mind that just because the EEOC currently seems to support a mandatory policy under certain conditions. That doesn't mean plaintiff's lawyers or, or the courts will agree with the EEOC uh, or that the EEOC's guidance won't change in the future. And we've already seen lawsuits filed by employees challenging their employer's right to implement a mandatory COVID vaccination policy. And I am absolutely certain that more will follow. So you should keep a close eye on, on case law development on the issue as you're considering what policy might work best for you. Aside from the many legal implications, you should not underestimate the possible negative effect that a mandatory policy could have on employee morale and on your workforce. I think as we often see, mandates of anything are generally controversial and employees likely will have very differing views on the necessity of getting the COVID vaccine. And as John mentioned, while fear or skepticism of the vaccine or, or being generally against vaccines are likely not legally protected reasons to refuse the vaccine, a mandatory policy may weaken employee morale. It could create tension in the workplace. It could possibly even cause you to lose high-performing employees who would rather quit than get vaccinated. So, so these sort of practical issues should definitely be uh, considered as you're um, determining what approach works best for you. Given all the legal challenges and, and practical issues uh, that I've just very quickly gone through, um, we've seen most employers are opting not to mandate the COVID vaccine, but instead are opting to encourage the vaccine in some fashion. Most are at least considering um, providing information on the benefits of vaccination and, and how their employees can get vaccinated. But some are, are offering some sort of incentive to employees to encourage vaccination, um, whether that's paid time off to get vaccinated, if not already mandated by state law, like in California and New York, um, extra vacation time, or gift cards, extra pay, or some, some other sort of financial incentive. The mandatory, uh, the, the voluntary approach is certainly less risky than a mandatory approach, um, but vaccine incentive programs are definitely not without risk or legal issues. For any vaccine incentive program, you should ensure that employees who cannot get the vaccine due to a disability or religious belief have some sort of alternative method to earn the incentive. Otherwise, you, you definitely may run the risk of discrimination claims. One thing you might consider is um, giving the incentive to an employee who cannot get vaccinated because of a disability if the employee uh, provides a doctor's note, some sort of alternative method. 
If you do decide to offer financial incentives, you should consider any um, tax issues, any income tax reporting and withholding consequences of the incentive. And keep in mind that the amount may be factored into the regular rate for calculating overtime. Last thing I want to say is, um, and this is this is definitely an evolving issue, but you should make sure the amount of the incentive is not so high that it could be perceived as mandating employee participation in a wellness program or coercing employees into disclosing health information that may violate the ADA or HIPAA or, or similar laws. I say this is evolving because the EEOC is expected to provide some additional guidance on wellness program regulations uh, and what sort of incentive may be deemed coercive, so definitely be on the lookout for that. So like I said at the beginning, there's no clear-cut answer to whether you should require or encourage COVID vaccinations in the workplace or what that policy should look like. Um, navigating these issues can be very difficult, uh, particularly in this ever-changing legal landscape. So I've seen a few questions come in. We'll do our best to get to those uh, as we continue with the presentation, but please feel free to uh, submit your questions or, or follow up with John and myself or any of our labor employment colleagues. And with that, I will turn it to Libby, who will talk about the Illinois Biometric Privacy Act and its effect on your re return to work plans. Thank you. The Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act was enacted in 2008, and it creates requirements related to retention, collection, disclosure, and destruction of biometric identifiers and biometric information. A biometric identifier is defined under the Act as a retina or iris scan, fingerprint, voice print, or scan of hand or face geometry. And the Act defines biometric information as any information, regardless of how it is captured, converted, stored, or shared based on an individual's biometric identifier used to identify an individual. Unlike a lot of statutes, the Biometric Information Privacy Act contains a private right of action and statutory damages. And the Illinois Supreme Court in the 2019 decision determined that a person does not have to have actual damages beyond a violation of their rights under the act in order to bring an action. So this means that an individual need not allege some actual injury or adverse effect beyond a violation of his or her rights under the act in order to qualify as an aggrieved person and be entitled to seek liquidated damages and injunctive relief pursuant to the act. So the reason that this act can have implications on return to work is that some solutions that might be considered in response to COVID may implicate um, it. So for example, a fingerprint or retina or iris scan used to verify the identity of someone as they do a temperature check may implicate BIPA, or a thermal scanning device that uses facial recognition to identify individuals may similarly um, fall within that scope. And there's already been litigation related to COVID brought under the uh, Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act. There was a suit brought against Amazon in the Circuit Court of Cook County, Illinois, and it has since been removed to federal court in the Northern District of Illinois. But it was filed on September 28, 2020, and it was brought as a class action. So that suit alleges that as a result of Amazon's conduct, Plaintiff and the putative class lost the right to control the collection of information and were exposed to ongoing, serious, and irreversible privacy risks by going into work. Uh, so plaintiff alleged that facial recognition devices were used to scan employees' facial geometry and take temperatures prior to workers entering the facility for work. And the suit further alleged that Amazon collects, captures, or otherwise obtains or stores plaintiff's biometric data, including facial geometry scans and other biometric identifiers in the database. And it alleges that Amazon never informed plaintiff in writing about the collection uh, or storing of the biometric data or the purpose and length of time for which it was being collected. And that plaintiff uh, never received, um, that, excuse me, that defendant never received a written release from plaintiff to collect, obtain, store, or use that biometric data, or that um, defendant adhered to a publicly available retention schedule. So this suit is still ongoing, and an amended complaint was filed uh, just, a, just last week on March 17, 2021, um, but it's definitely a suit to watch, and it's styled as Naughton versus Amazon. 
And there are other states that have statues related to biometrics. Uh, for example, Texas um, has the Capture Use of Biometric Identifier Act, uh, but this differs from BIPA in that the power to enforce the um, enforce relates, re excuse me, rests solely with the Texas Attorney General, and there is no private right of action. But it imposes similar requirements related to notice, consent, and prohibitions on disclosure, as well as mandatory data security measures. And similarly, Washington has a statute that prohibits any company or individual from entering biometric data in a database for a commercial purpose without first providing notice, obtaining consent, or providing a mechanism to prevent the subsequent use of a biometric identifier for a commercial purpose. But like Texas, it does not provide for a private right of action, but authorizes enforcement by the uh, uh, Washington Attorney General. And then further, some other states include biometric data in the definition of covered information within the context of data breach response laws, uh, such as Arkansas. And one state to watch is New York, which has proposed legislation, um, Assembly Bill 26, 2021. Uh, this would provide for a private right of action, including statutory damages. And it's styled as the Biometric Privacy Act. And uh, one reason to keep an eye on this um, proposed legislation is that if that does pass in New York, it would take effect very quickly, um, 90 days after it becomes law. So for these reasons, um, the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act is um, one, one thing to keep in mind with return to work. And now I will turn it over to Jim. No, thanks very much, Libby. Uh, yeah, very interesting issues there. And Looking at, at sort of other privacy laws, I mean, there's, there's a huge number of privacy laws out there, but at the federal level, at state level, the vast majority of those were enacted without a pandemic in mind. We couldn't cover all of them here, and many are not implicated in the return to work, but there are a few I'd like to, to note here, either as to why they apply or may not apply, at least at this point. Um, at the federal level, privacy is generally addressed it as, as a sectoral issue. So financial services uh, entities are subject to the Gravis Bliley Act. I would note that GLBA doesn't cover employees because they're not obtaining a financial product or service for personal, family, or household purposes. Um, in healthcare, we have HIPAA, you know, which applies to a covered entity, business associate, um, noting that it's out there, but it's a, that's a huge topic. It would be uh, an entire other webinar, but I wanted to note it particularly in light of a few state law exemptions that, um, that are, are uh, coming up here. At the state level, I mean, the, the state privacy laws are generally consumer focused and then often exempt employees from their scope. Um, the California Consumer Privacy Act and then the subsequent Privacy Rights Act um, generally regulate entities that, that qualify as a business. So an entity that meets certain size or activity thresholds and that then determines how personal information, so information that can be attributed to a particular individual, how that information is processed. And so those, those entities that are called a business have the primary compliance obligations under CCPA and CPRA. Um, service providers can only process the information as directed by the business. Now, um, there are several exemptions that, that are important with CCPA. Um, most notably, that it exempts personal information that relates to employees. And then this is broader than you might think because it covers employees, it covers contractors, it covers applicants for, for jobs. So um, in order to uh, employ, use that exemption, um, you still have to provide the employees with a, a notice of privacy practices prior to collection of that personal information. Uh, so they're not subject to a lot of the other requirements, such as the, the deletion right or right to obtain further information, but they are uh, required to get that, that notice. So you may have to give a notice to employees prior to collecting personal information uh, as part of the return to work. Um, so I, I, along those lines, I would make sure that if you're going to be collecting personal information from employees as part of the return to work, make sure that that's covered in the employee privacy notice that you have or that you're, you're going to issue. Um, another important state law in this area uh, that you may have heard about, the very recently enacted Consumer Data Protection Act 
in Virginia, uh, which is which I would note first is not effective until January 1st of 2023. It contains somewhat similar requirements, although somewhat lesser requirements than what, what you have under CCPA. And I would also note that it has similar exemptions. Um, it, it, the definition of a consumer you know, who has the rights under, under uh, CDPA uh, is only an individual who's uh, acting in an individual or household context and excludes where somebody's acting in a commercial or employment context. Um, I would also note, though, that the, this uh, CDPA has requirements on precise geolocation data. Um, so, and, and I mention this particularly because a lot of states are considering privacy laws right now. And as states do that, they're often borrowing aspects from other laws that have been enacted. And so when they see su subsequent laws that take some of the requirements of California or Virginia, and they're not necessarily going to exempt everyone, such as employees, as has been done under those laws. And so uh, with that in mind, I think thinking uh, broader in terms of, of privacy and the return to work, um, keep up on legal changes. I mean, the, the pandemic is often leading to quicker legislative and regulatory processes than we had before. Um, to keep up on, on those requirements as, as they're being considered and being enacted. Uh, watch states that tend to be leaders, as Ryan noted. Uh, California, New York, as well as Illinois, um, tend to be more activists and lead other states and act as a model for other states. Uh, I would also note that legal requirements in the privacy space outside the U.S. are often much more stringent than what we have here. And the ability to, to uh, impose things on, on employees is often much more limited. Um, I would also note that contractual obligations for, for privacy can often be more stringent than the legal ones. So be aware of what you've agreed to do, what you said you'd do, either in a contract or in public statements about your company, um, because not doing that can lead to a deceptive uh, activities claim um, that could get you in trouble. Um, I would also be aware there, there's actually this term in privacy you hear sometimes used called the creepiness factor. Um, keep that in mind. If, if something makes you uncomfortable, it may make your employees or others un uncomfortable as well. Um, so consider if you really need personal information to do what you're going to do, and then what, when you collect it, only keep it as long as you need. Um, you may also want to consider a credit card processing model where a lot of companies in the e-commerce space completely outsource the taking of credit cards as payment. They just basically want to sell the goods or services and get paid for it. They don't need the, the actual uh, credit card information. So you may be able to do something like that in this space too. You may be able to use a vendor that would actually collect all the personal information on your behalf um, and so that you don't actually have to touch it. That may ease the, the uh, compliance burden. And I would also note if your business is public facing, you know, we've been talking about um, employees here, but some of the privacy exemptions that apply for employees won't cover customers and others that maybe you may be in contact with. So with that, um, yeah, I, I want to open it up for if we have any additional uh, questions and answers. I know a few uh, items have come in, um, but I, I, I want to you know, also allow to uh, my, my uh, co-panelists if they'd like to go back and address any any issues uh, before we close up here. Thanks, Jim. Um, we've got a couple questions that came in um, that I want to address uh, related to vaccines. So I'll, I'll pose this to John. Question is, can you require an employee who refuses to get vaccinated to take and disclose the results of regular COVID-19 infection tests, and even if you don't require testing of those who have been vaccine, vaccinated? The answer to that question is yes. The EEOC has provided guidance that you can require your employees to submit to COVID-19 viral testing before they enter your workplace. And of course, you should not really disclose the result of the test to anyone. That needs to be kept confidential. But I think it's important to note, and this, this is kind of part of the same question, you really can't require employees to have COVID-19 antibody testing. 
So you can require viral testing. In other words, have they had the virus, but you can't, do they have the virus, but you can't revive, you cannot require antibody testing, which asks, have they had the, the virus in the past? And the difference is that the antibody testing is designed to detect past or even waning COVID-19 infections. And also such tests are less accurate and reliable than viral testing for, defect, for detecting infections of COVID-19. And therefore, the EEOC has concluded that antibody testing is not job-related and not necessary to reduce COVID-19 workplace transmission. So viral testing is a yes, antibody testing is a no. Uh, another question that's come in is, and I'll let Ryan answer this one, can an employer require its employees to return to work in person rather than to continue working remotely? Thanks, John. Um, the short answer is yes, but. And the but is you really need to go through the same analysis you would uh, for how you would handle disability-related objections to the vaccine or any objections to the vaccine. So, um, you know, talk with the employee and find out why it is that uh, he or she is not wanting to return to work in person. If it's because of some fear of catching the virus or a fear of, um, you know, getting other household members sick uh, by going back to work, that, that alone won't likely be a uh, protected basis to object to returning to work. Um, if, for example, the employee says, I don't want to return to work because um, of some medical condition that puts them at high risk um, if they catch the virus, then I think you need to go through the same interactive process that John talked about under the ADA and see if there's a reasonable accommodation that you can give to that employee um, rather than requiring the return to work at the office. Um, so that's, it's essentially the same analysis that uh, John talked about. And there's been um, lawsuits on this very issue. Uh, in California, there was a lawsuit uh, where the employee sued the company claiming that they violated the ADA uh, because he reasonably asked to continue working from home during the pandemic due to his inflammatory lung disease. Uh, an increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19. And um, the employee alleges that he was fired days after requesting that accommodation for his known disability. And um, the employer told him that his, his job loss was part of pandemic-related cuts, but none of his colleagues had also been, um, who had also been working remotely were fired. So I would keep a close eye on case law as it develops on that issue. Um, so there's... Two minutes left. The one question that just came in. If the company doesn't require vaccines, but the government requires vaccines to travel, and those employees are required to work uh, travel, will the employer be considered mandating vaccines? John, did you want to quickly take this one? I can add some thoughts as well. Sure, Ryan, I'm just here with us. No, the employer will not be considered as mandating vaccines in that circumstance, I think. If it, and the government is not re, the government is not requiring vaccines to travel at this point, as far as I know. I mean, you are required to wear a mask when you're on a plane. Uh, you, you're in some localities required to wear a mask while in public, but there's no government rule or law or regulation requiring vaccines for travel. I mean, we've heard a lot about perhaps certain governments, including some state governments such as Hawaii and Massachusetts and some countries in Europe are considering having what they call a vaccine passport, which you'll need to have in order to travel to those locations without quarantining. But so far, that has not come to pass. And as of now, uh, if the government requires vaccines to travel and your company doesn't, your company doesn't require them, that's not going to be mandated by your company because, after all, as the CDC has given us a tip, you can video conference instead of traveling. 
and maybe it's not as good as we'll all say and admit to as being in person, but it is a reasonable accommodation instead of, I mean, it's really not a disability issue, but it's a reasonable way to conduct business during this pandemic, I think. Yeah, I'd agree. And I would just also add that if for some reason uh, a mandate comes from the government, um, you know, the employer would be complying with, with whatever that applicable law may be. So it's not the mandate I wouldn't say is coming from the employer. If, if you're concerned about um, legal liability about mandating that, you're, you're complying with the law if, if, if we get to there. And I don't, I don't think we necessarily will, but. You know, another question that also comes up is if what if my state, and there's about 15 of them, has announced that mask wearing is not required? Does that mean that I, as an employer, cannot require the wearing of masks in the workplace? The answer to that question is no. You're a private business. You can still require people to wear masks in your workplace. And OSHA, Cal OSHA, the CDC, they all require it. So what you hear on the news about various states, such as Texas, saying you don't have to wear a mask in Texas, you still as a private employer can require and should require your employees to wear masks. Okay. And, thanks, and thanks something everyone. Else that, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, so ahead. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, One other I question. Quickly note as we're getting... Yeah, we're, getting, we're getting close to time. I wanted to note that we have several resources uh, available on this, this uh, slide that's, that you can see right now, the, both on the privacy and employment side, uh, many of the things that have been mentioned during the, the, the webinar today. Um, and so th those are available to you, and I think they might provide useful guidance uh, for everyone. Um, but with that, I, I, uh, any of the panelists have additional questions, comments? All right. Well, uh, I'd like to you know, thank everyone for participating in the, the webinar. Thanks to all our panelists for providing a, a, a wealth of, of great knowledge and, and thoughts here. Um, please, uh, if you have a chance, please complete and submit the survey that's in the widget at the bottom of your screen. And uh, thank you very much for, for coming today. And uh, certainly let us know if you have uh, further questions on on these topics from a, a, a labor and employment or privacy perspective. Uh, thanks, everyone.